events at the flames club. Where did this ship? This is the most tragic man-made accident in human space travel. 5,000 humans in cryosleep were sent into outer space, awaiting endless darkness and loneliness. Eventually, they would succumb to despair and die alone. The reason behind such a heinous act by the pilot was his affliction with space psychosis. Prolonged periods of space travel or cryosleep can induce this condition. Symptoms range from hallucinations and memory loss to severe personality disorders, leading to anti-human and antisocial behavior. The story unfolds in the year 2153 when the world's population skyrocketed to 24.4 billion. With Earth's resources dwindling and wars raging among nations, humanity had no choice but to turn its gaze towards the vast expanse of space. Several years later, a probe discovered a habitable planet named Tanis. It closely resembled Earth's environment and even had its own ecosystem. By 2174, human technology had advanced enough for interstellar travel. As Earth's resources neared depletion, a spacecraft named Elysium set off for the planet Tanis with 60,000 human couples as immigrants. Given the 123-year journey, they all entered cryosleep. During the voyage, the ship's operations were handled by crews rotating in teams of three. After an unknown duration, a crew member suddenly woke up from cryosleep. Affected by the side effects of prolonged hibernation, he couldn't remember where he was or his identity. It was only upon seeing his name on the cryosleep pod that he realized he was called Bauer. Slowly, he began to regain some of his lost memories. However, upon putting on his clothes, Bauer discovered that the spacecraft's power system had malfunctioned, and the airlock wouldn't open. Just as Bauer was at a loss for what to do, another cryosleep pod was opened. The person who woke up was named Peyton, Bauer's captain. With Bauer's help, Peyton quickly regained some of his memories. They realized they weren't awakened normally but by the ship's computer. There were no signs of their relief crew arriving. To figure out what was happening, Peyton skillfully activated the console. Despite his attempts, they received no response. Even more bizarrely, their third crew member was nowhere to be found. These strange occurrences made them realize that something might have gone wrong with the ship. Regardless, their top priority was to restore power to the spacecraft. Bauer suspected a problem with the reactor and decided to reboot it while Peyton remained to oversee. Since all the bulkheads were closed, Bauer had to crawl through the ventilation ducts. However, he accidentally fell and stumbled upon a desiccated corpse. Judging by the name on the clothing, it was their missing crew member. It seemed like an accident occurred while climbing out. Bauer didn't linger and quickly removed the panel below the duct to reach the outside. Armed with a flashlight, he began to investigate but suddenly heard unusual noises. Upon investigation, he found a woman attempting to pry open a door. She fled in panic when she saw Bauer. As he pursued her, he encountered a motionless figure standing in the corridor. Attempts to communicate yielded no response. Upon closer inspection, he discovered it was a corpse hanging in a grisly manner. Suspended by a steel wire, it appeared to be a trap set by someone else. Just then, the woman who had attacked Bauer from behind reappeared and once again held a blade to his throat. Despite Bauer's attempts to identify himself as a crew member, the woman ignored him, frantically searching him for valuables and even ordering him to remove his shoes. As Bauer prepared to comply, the woman suddenly glanced ahead, sensing something approaching. When Bauer turned back, the woman had vanished again. Amidst terrifying howls, the corpse hanging behind Bauer was suddenly dragged upwards, revealing a bizarre figure feasting upon it. Petrified, Bauer turned and fled, seeking refuge in a nearby room. Cautiously observing from the shadows, he finally discerned the true nature of these pale creatures haunting the ship. Who were they, and why were they aboard the spacecraft? Trembling in the corner, Bauer tried to make sense of the situation. Just then, Peyton's voice crackled through the communicator. Bauer quickly covered it with his hand, but the sound still lured the creatures. Fortunately, they were drawn to the corpse, sparing Bauer for the moment. Once the coast was clear, Bauer urgently relayed everything he had witnessed to Peyton. However, Peyton stressed the immediate need to reboot the reactor and gain control of the ship from the cockpit. As a safety measure, Bauer first headed to the armory, equipping himself with a pulse weapon. Though not particularly potent, it was better than nothing, especially given the circumstances. Following Peyton's guidance, Bauer set off toward the reactor. Yet, he soon stumbled upon another crew member caught in a trap suggesting that these traps were indeed set by the creatures haunting the ship. Bauer thought the crew member was dead, but as soon as he approached, the man suddenly opened his eyes. 
Reacting quickly, Bauer hushed him because any noise could attract the monsters. Once the man quieted down, Bauer rescued him from the trap. Seeing the code on the crew member's arm, Bauer realized he was from the sixth team, while Bauer belonged to the fifth team, indicating they were on the same shift rotation. Bauer asked him what happened, but the crew member remained silent, only focusing on covering himself in oil to mask his scent and avoid detection by the monsters. After finishing, the man prepared to leave but heard the monsters' growls, indicating they were close by. He hastily ran in the opposite direction, with Bauer following closely behind. However, the monsters soon spotted them, and the crew member, coated in oil, was quickly discovered. The monsters hoisted him up and devoured him on the spot. Bauer attempted to help but found his weapon ineffective and inadvertently revealed his own position. While fleeing, he fell into a trap set by the monsters. In the nick of time, a figure appeared and cut the rope, rescuing him. The person, named Man, was from the agriculture department. Learning of Bauer's plan to restart the reactor, Man decided to accompany him. Upon opening a steel door, they encountered the woman from earlier. A scuffle ensued, with Bauer accidentally pushed down by her. As she attempted to rob Bauer, Man intervened just in time, showcasing their survival skills honed during their time aboard the spacecraft. As they fought reluctantly, Bauer decisively fired a pulse cannon to stop them. After all, their true enemies were the monsters. To survive and escape, unity was crucial. Seeing that neither party harbored ill intentions, the woman gradually let down her guard and chose to join forces with them, forming a trio. She was familiar with the ship's environment and knew a shortcut to the reactor. However, just as she opened the door, the pesky monsters caught up again. In a crucial moment, Bauer's pulse weapon proved effective, allowing them to quickly open the door and rush inside. At the last second, they successfully sealed the door behind them. It turned out to be a massive gene bank, containing samples of nearly all Earth's organisms. It was like a Noah's Ark, the most crucial laboratory aboard the ship. Hence, its power system was independent. The woman, Nadia, was the biologist in charge of the gene bank. She had been living there since awakening. However, if they didn't restart the reactor soon, the power supply wouldn't last long, dooming all the organisms. After explaining, Nadia brought out a grasshopper, providing Bauer with some protein. Then, the trio continued toward their destination. Upon reaching a hibernation chamber, they discovered many empty pods. According to Nadia, the hibernation chamber was the monster's hunting ground. Most people became their prey before awakening. Clearly, it wasn't safe to linger. However, not long after stepping out, both Bauer and Nadia fell through. When the glow stick illuminated the surroundings, they were horrified to see human skeletons, remnants of the monster's feasts, as far as the eye could see. As they climbed up from below, they spotted a monster waiting outside for quite some time. Before Bauer could even pull the trigger, he was kicked away by the creature, his weapon falling to the ground. Fortunately, Nadia intervened just in time. However, the monster vanished in the blink of an eye. While Nadia surveyed the surroundings, a creature lurking above suddenly descended, swiftly overpowering her before Bauer could react. Seeing this, Bauer rushed forward to push the monster away, only to be kicked aside himself. As the monster prepared to strike again, Bauer grabbed an iron rod and swung at it. However, the damage inflicted was minimal, akin to scratching an itch for the creature. Just then, man joined the fray. Though formidable, the monsters couldn't withstand the simultaneous assault of the three. However, as they finally dealt with one monster, they realized the leader had been watching from on high. With a command, hordes of monsters swarmed toward them. With no choice, the trio fled, but to Bauer's surprise, the monsters first devoured their fallen comrades. It seemed that due to the shortage of food on the ship, the monsters resorted to the cruelest survival tactics. Nonetheless, a few monsters continued to chase them. During their escape, they accidentally opened a hibernation pod. The man inside became instant prey for the monsters, allowing the trio to evade capture. Meanwhile, in the control room, Peyton heard unusual noises. Armed with an iron rod, he investigated and stumbled upon a survivor named Gallo, a member of the fourth shift team. He explained that the ship had malfunctioned while they were on duty. Seeing the bloodstains on his body, Peyton immediately interrogated Gallo about what had happened. Gallo mentioned the space confinement syndrome, explaining that the other two crew members had succumbed to severe cases, descending into madness. To protect himself, Gallo claimed he had no choice but to eliminate them. Hearing this, Peyton became suspicious. 
the odds of two people developing severe space confinement syndrome simultaneously were extremely low. He distrusted Gallo and promptly locked him inside a hibernation pod. Meanwhile, the trio that had narrowly escaped found refuge in a secluded chamber, where they encountered another survivor named Leland. Leland had been living alone in the chamber, unsure of how long. His survival strategy revolved around mistrusting everyone. Nonetheless, he kindly inquired if the trio were hungry and offered them some dark-colored food. During their conversation, Nadia and Bauer speculated about the origins of the creatures outside. Nadia, being a biologist, theorized that the monsters had evolved from the immigrants aboard the Elysium. Before boarding the Elysium, everyone had been injected with an enzyme to help them adapt quickly to their new home's environment. The conditions on the spaceship had accelerated their evolution into these creatures. However, such a transformation couldn't have occurred in such a short time frame. The only plausible explanation was that they had been awakened much earlier than anticipated. Listening to their discussion, Leland disclosed everything he knew. Shortly after the Elysium departed Earth, they received a desperate message indicating that humanity had perished due to wars among themselves. Earth had completely vanished from the solar system. You're all that's left of us. Good luck. Upon learning of Earth's demise, the three crew members on duty were severely shaken. Their spirits gradually deteriorated, ultimately descending into madness. They even began to turn on each other, leaving only one survivor. Freed from moral and legal constraints, this survivor spiraled into madness and assumed the role of a god, manipulating everyone aboard the ship. He withheld the news of Earth's fate, playing with the lives of the other passengers like pawns in a sick game. Randomly, he would open hibernation pods, banishing the immigrants into the same chamber to fend for themselves, creating a society where survival meant resorting to cannibalism. Over time, the immigrants who survived the bloodshed transformed into the creatures outside. The enzyme only hastened their evolution. Despite the unsettling revelation, the trio remained resolute, determined to restart the reactor and preserve humanity's last hope. However, Peyton delivered grim news, their time was running out. If they didn't restart the reactor soon, the ship's entire system would collapse, dooming everyone aboard. Reluctantly, Leland joined their cause. Following Peyton's guidance, the four-person team set out. Unbeknownst to them, the man who claimed to be a god, Gallo, whom Peyton had imprisoned, had awakened once again. Thankfully, their journey to the reactor proceeded smoothly, but they soon discovered that the reactor's location was also the monster's lair. Hordes of creatures lay sleeping below, and to restart the reactor, they would have to cross the suspension bridge before them. Due to years of neglect, the suspension bridge was on the verge of collapse. With Nadia and Mana's coordination, Bauer narrowly escaped death. However, he slipped and fell to the next level. Fortunately, his fall didn't alert the monsters below. Nadia successfully reached the other side but was at a loss for the device's password. Unable to make a sound, she relied on Bauer's help. Bauer, now below, attempted to climb the stairs amidst the monsters. To mask his scent, he covered himself with a blood-stained cloth, inching forward cautiously to avoid any noise. Yet, as expected, disaster struck when Leland's flashlight fell, awakening all the monsters. Spotted, Bauer scrambled upward desperately, eventually reaching his destination with Nadia's assistance. However, the monsters closed in. Seeing this, Leland made a quick exit. To protect the others, Man released the bridge, luring the monsters away with a loud shout and tossing his weapon. Seizing the opportunity, Bauer entered the password and finally restarted the reactor. A surge of energy erupted, incinerating all the surrounding monsters into ashes. With the ship restored to normalcy, the two completed their mission and planned to rendezvous with Peyton in the control room. However, Man wasn't as fortunate. The monster leader caught up with him, displaying a surprising sense of honor by offering his weapon, seeking a fair fight. Underestimating his own strength, the monster leader initially had the upper hand, causing Man considerable trouble. However, he made a fatal mistake by biting Man's waist. Seizing the opportunity, Man pulled out the leader's weapon and relentlessly attacked his neck, resulting in the arrogant leader's demise. As Man prepared to leave, a small monster child appeared behind him. Despite the seemingly harmless appearance, the child suddenly wielded a hidden knife, slashing Mana's throat. Meanwhile, in the control room, Gallo, who was supposedly confined to a hibernation pod, emerged with a tranquilizer aimed at Peyton. They engaged in a fierce struggle, ending with Peyton being subdued. 
However, when the tranquilizer entered Peyton's body, a strange phenomenon occurred, they merged into one entity, leaving only Peyton behind. It turned out that Gala was the real identity of Peyton, and everything that had happened was a manifestation of his alternate personality. He had occupied Peyton's hibernation pod and impersonated Bowers' captain. When Leland finally arrived in the control room, Gallo, now awakened, fatally injected him. Nadia and Bauer eventually arrived, but Bauer grew suspicious, realizing that the man before him wasn't his captain. As time passed, Bauer's memories fully returned, and he realized that the man before him was not his captain at all. With everything laid bare, Gallo had no choice but to admit that he was the one responsible for the disaster that befell the spaceship. Gallo relentlessly tried to convince Bauer to join him in building a new world. However, Bauer was only concerned with knowing where the spaceship had ended up. Under Bauer's threat, Gallo opened the spaceship's protective shield, revealing not the vastness of space but a colorful ocean teeming with marine life. They had arrived at the Tannis planet. However, due to the unmanned spaceship's automatic landing in the ocean, they discovered that they had arrived in the year 3097, 923 years past the planned arrival date. The astonishing revelation left Bauer struggling to accept the truth. Suddenly, Gallo launched an attack against him, plunging the scene into chaos. In the midst of the turmoil, Bauer accidentally struck a nearby device with his weapon, causing shards to break the glass above. Under the immense pressure of the deep sea, the cracks widened rapidly. Bauer swiftly led Nadia towards the escape pods as a massive influx of seawater flooded the interior of the spaceship. Gallo, unable to escape in time, was engulfed by the water, bringing an end to his twisted life. Fortunately, Bauer and Nadia made it into the escape pod just as the water threatened to engulf them completely. In the nick of time, the escape pod ejected from the spaceship. As they ascended, water continued to seep into the pod, but they persevered until they successfully reached the surface of the ocean. As the hatch opened, the two of them breathed in the air of their new home for the first time. At that moment, the ship detected a breach in its hull and ejected the remaining 1,211 cryopods. Soon, the surface of the sea was littered with cryopods. The survivors, carrying the last hope of humanity, would continue to build upon Earth's civilization on this new planet.